My name is Eric Lecoq, and you are listening to Ingredient Insiders. This is Ingredient Insiders. I'm John Magazzino. And I'm Andrea Parkins. On each episode of Ingredient Insiders, we will be talking with chefs and food writers about their favorite ingredients. We then speak to the producer of that ingredient to learn its history, how it's made, and why chefs love using it in their kitchens. So, Andrea, a couple of days ago, I was watching this show that I had not seen before. Maybe I'm the only person on the planet, but it's called The Great British Baking Show. Have you seen this? I've never seen it before. It's so good, John. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty good. If you haven't seen it, and and maybe I'm I'm saying this wrong because I haven't seen it before, but you have these professional chefs who kind of show you what, uh, you know, properly made Mm -hmm. dessert or pastry is. It's Paul Hollywood. It's his show. Right, British guy, yep. Mm -hmm. And then... After he shows you the proper way of something was made, then, or he shows you the end result. Mm -hmm. You have to make it. Then you make it. And, you know, it's disastrous with everybody, you know, these laymen trying to make something. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, I'm watching this episode and they're making this incredible puff pastry with laminated dough. And I know that that is not easy for anybody to make. And so Absolutely they, they showed this really beautiful thing that had raspberry glaze and all this. Anyhow, it, it's really tough. Like laminated oh, yeah. dough and puff pastry is no joke. Typically on that show, what I've seen them do is called like a rough puff. Yeah. Where you take very, very cold butter and you grate it on a cheese grater. That's what they were doing. There you go. So it's kind of a, a quick version of making a puff pastry and or a laminated dough. And folded it over yep. and rolled it out and folded it and rested it. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, I... If you know, I don't know why anybody doesn't just buy the stuff already pre made. Right. I mean, I typically do myself. The other thing that I saw on social media, John, and I don't know if you've seen this, is it's a croissant ice cream cone. Yeah. But yeah. instead, so they cut their croissant in half. Yeah. Not like a horizontal. Yeah, and then they fill it with soft serve ice cream. Oh, my. So the croissant is the cone. Delicious. And I don't know. I mean, working at Chef's Warehouse, we eat Brodeur and Le Coque croissants all the time. I can only imagine how good that would be to use a Le Coque croissant as an ice cream cone. Yeah. Well, this is going to be a great episode. We're talking with Eric Le Coque and Brie Dore about the incredible puff pastries, laminated, laminated doughs, dough. all of that great stuff from France. This season of Ingredient Insiders is brought to you by Bazzini Nuts. Bazzini is the brand of choice among chefs in the finest hotels and restaurants. Their legacy of quality extends to gourmet retail stores, specialty boutiques, grocery distributors, and delis, ensuring you have access to their extensive range of consumer retail packages. It all started in 1886 when Italian immigrant Anthony L. Bazzini began selling nuts by the pound to bakers, street vendors, and individuals during the Great Depression. But Bazzini Nuts isn't just about peanuts. They offer a delightful array of nuts like cashews, almonds, pecans, pistachios, hazelnuts, and more, plus a tempting selection of dried fruit, including apricots, cranberries, figs, dates, prunes, and tomatoes. So whether at the ballpark, in the kitchen, or indulging in some well-deserved self-care, choose Bazzini Nuts. With a legacy spanning 137 years, they're here to serve your needs with the same consistency, reliability, and quality, making them an iconic name in the world of nuts and dried fruits. Bazzini Nuts, tradition, quality, and taste all in one. Taste the legacy today. This episode is in partnership with the Chef's Warehouse and produced by Gotham Production Studios in New York City. Bonjour, Andrea. Bonjour, John. Um, wow, here we are in New York City, Pier 17. This is like the coolest venue, I would say, in the city. It's beautiful. It's right gorgeous. over my shoulder oh. is the South Street Seaport. Mm-hmm. There's a ship out there. There is. We're right on the East River. I see the river glistening. Mm -hmm. And glistening in front of us is Eric Lecoq from Lecoq Pastries. Pastries. He's the founder. He's got an incredible history. He's produced some amazing puff pastries and other products that we're going to talk about. And we're very lucky to have him here. So lucky. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how this all started for you? Did you start cooking at a young age? Or? Let's go way, way back with okay. him. Okay, where you, were you born? We, yes. What, what day, is your what, birthday? Exactly. No. <laughs> it's a good thing this isn't live, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's a great starting point is you're from France. Where did you grow up? 
Well, first, uh, good morning as well. Yeah. And uh, so I'm from France. I'm from Normandy. Uh, I grew up there inland, not on the coast. Uh, very beautiful, very rich, a lot of beautiful products. And uh, that's where I'm coming from. A lot of great butter, too. Mm -hmm. Beautiful butter. Which beautiful. I'm sure plays a part in those delicious yeah, Is that your, your inspiration? Absolutely part of it, yes. So did you start cooking at a very young age? Were you a pastry chef, apprentice? How old were you when you started working professionally in the kitchen? Uh, professionally, I was uh, 16. 16. But from a young age, I would literally... I have the best memory, actually, of, of course, like every other chef, having my grandparents on parents cooking. Mm -hmm. So my grandmothers and my mom were all amazing chefs uh, at the house, of course. And then there was this TV show with Michelle Oliver, um, not the one that we know presently. Uh -huh. And uh, it was uh, on Saturday at noon. And I would rush from school, watch this segment, and then cook that over the weekend, either that Saturday night or Sunday. I love so it. That's that's how I really got to express, to start to produce, you know, food myself. Do you know that those shows are on YouTube today? Yes. And I watch old episodes really? of them, exactly what you're talking about. Absolutely. And there's also one, there's Michelle Olivier, and then there's two women, and I cannot remember their names, but... There are these great old French cooking shows on TV from the 60s and 70s, and they usually have like the you know the celebrity chefs of that time, whether it's Paul Bocuse. Mm -hmm. I mean, or I've watched Julia Child's Alain, Alain Chappelle. Yeah. yeah, it's the French version of yeah. that, and I am always blown away when I watch that. They, they were the pioneer. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's how it all started to be here now, mm -hmm. pretty much to really take food to the next level which is, of course, this amazing world that we all love. So you grew up just, it was kind of in your blood, your grandmothers, your parents mm -hmm. were great home cooks. What was the first restaurant job that you got? Um, so it was, I grew up as a, I, I was trained as a pastry chef and baker. So my first job uh, uh, before was in a pastry shop, not in a restaurant. Uh -huh. So have you only done sweets or have you also... Maybe savory bread on savory okay the, the whole nine yards the way we do it in france so full-blown pastry chef chocolatier ice cream and also baker and uh and of course uh, you have the traiteur which is a uh, catering mm -hmm. so then the savories and before i came to the states uh i had a job while i was waiting for my visa at la bourride in caen mm -hmm. normandy and that was a Michelin star restaurant. So really big eye opener. Absolutely loved it, of course. And what was your impetus to come to the United States? The American dream. Oh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the choice of coming to the States was born way younger than uh, when I studied my industry. I actually chose to probably live in the state at the age of 14. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Was there something that, you know, was it like a movie or a television show or? I came to the state as an exchange student for one year. Oh, cool. And, I love it. Uh, yeah. so, and you fell in love. I absolutely did. So how old were you when you moved to the States? I actually, when I, after that first year, I came back to the States. Uh, I work in, in New York at Le Bernardine and uh, I was 20. Have you ever heard of that restaurant, John? I have heard of you it. You have? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty fancy. It's pretty well known. But what's interesting is everybody knows Le Bernardin and Eric Repair. Eric and I were speaking earlier. He worked at the era when Gilbert Lacoz and his sister Maggie were really the, you know, Gilbert in the kitchen, Maggie Absolutely. running the front of the house. And this was considered at that time, you know, the greatest French restaurant mm -hmm. in America. Um, tell us a little bit about what it was like working there back in back in those days. This uh, is in the... You said 89? 89. Yeah. Late 80s, yeah. early 90s. Yeah, so I originally, my visa was with another restaurant, but back then getting a visa took a long time. Um, by the time I got the visa, hmm, uh, sorry, we just hired someone a month ago. I said, okay, no problem. Do you mind if I come? I know the visa can be transferred. They say, okay. So I was very lucky because through that experience, um, I met Jacques Torres at the time at Le Cirque. 
on Daniel. So I interviewed everywhere. And actually, I decided to work for Le Bernardin with Gilbert only because I thought his restaurant was phenomenal, but all the others were as well. I even met Thomas Keller mm -hmm. at a restaurant downtown called Raquel. Sure. I don't know if you yeah. recall. Uh, but uh, I was attracted probably because of La Bouride. The uh, chef of La Bouride knew Gilbert, so he spoke to me quite a lot of him. And uh, I was already sold. Little I knew I was going to end up working with him. But I met a whole bunch of chefs from the beginning, and that was really the beginning of my career. And uh, working at the Bernardin was really amazing. One of my reasons for being there was to help them re-inject new menu on the pastry side and uh, with the rest of the team, of course. But I was, uh, I was very privileged to work pretty much uh, exclusively with Gilbert on that creation for 70% of the menu. And we just had so much fun. Gilbert was a visionary uh, for sure, but also he had a passion like every other great chef. It was just sublime. And I really, really enjoyed working with him. His taste on mine were absolutely on par. We had different test buds because Gilbert used to smoke cigarettes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, but our palate just were in total communion the whole time. He could, a ah, little bit of this. And I already knew he was going to say it because I felt it. It was really special. That's awesome to hear. Is he... He was Gilbert from Brittany or from Brittany? Yes, from Brittany. So not too far from Normandy. Not too far. Uh, yes, beautiful place, and that's why his specialty was the fish because uh, they have the best fishes in, yeah. in Brittany. And I'm and so I'm assuming also that you were working with a young Eric Repair as well. He was not there. He wasn't wow. even there yet. No, the chef de cuisine was uh, Eberhard Müller at oh, the time. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, which I'm we sure know you know well. Arts, yeah. Our farms, yeah. Yeah. So Eberhard was the chef de cuisine. And uh, oh, it was a wonderful era, of course. That's amazing. And how we, long were you? How long was that stint? Uh, a year. Okay. And then, when you're young, you have two things to do: uh, keep moving, mm -hmm. so you keep bringing up your knowledge. So a year on. Uh, but prior to that, I worked in Paris in one of the most prestigious pastry shop. It was Dalloyau. I'm sure you know of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were three top places: Dalloyau, Le Nôtre. And uh, hmm, I'm having a blank now, but uh, another small pastry shop that was really, really great. So you either wanted to work in one of those three. Um, Dalloyau was full of uh, Meilleur Ouvrier de France, best mm -hmm. worker of France. Mm -hmm. So already all that era, I was close to perfection, um, which kind of matched my personality. When did you, I guess, realize that you wanted to kind of break off from working in restaurants and pastry shops and do something for yourself? Oh, before I came, that Real, was the plan. You always knew you wanted... Uh, yeah, at 14, I made that decision. I will come on... Uh, uh, the, the plan was, the vision was to create a retail store chain. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of money. And when I felt ready to do so, which came in a really funny way, um, I decided to go for it. So, I... so you were very ambitious from a very yeah. young age. You knew you wanted to have, when you said retail, so you wanted to have a, a specialty pastry store or were you thinking even bigger than that? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> pastry shop, uh, bakery, but not just one. You I wanted plan... multiple at the age of 14. Uh, yeah. John, when you were 14, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, an astronaut. Astronaut? <laughs> I don't even know. I was just... right. I don't. Like, I'm thinking. I'm like. I have. I don't know if I had. I did not have that crazy ambition at yeah, that no, age. Yeah, the vision, which is fantastic. That's amazing. Well, we were kind of close to each other. I wanted to be a pilot, but at 12 and a half, I got glasses. Yeah. Mm. So that killed it. In France, you couldn't be a commercial pilot with uh, corrected vision. So that's how I ended up in pastry. Lucky for us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um. So tell us about, Andrea, that's that question. So tell us about that launch from restaurant to having your own business. How did you do that? Because we, yeah. we have a lot of pastry chefs who are listeners to the show that may have that same dream of, you know what, I'm working in this kitchen. I'd like to be, you know, have my own pastry shop or bakery. What, how do you do that? Well, first, when since I started young, I was 23, you're unconscious and don't really know 
don't have fear, don't really know what you're doing. Sure. So that's okay. It makes it very easy. But the reality is, um, so after uh, Le Bernardin, I did two other jobs. Um, when I was looking for my fourth job on the fourth year, wherever I would go, I was accepted for the position, but I was not into it. Um, a friend of uh, Del Royo, uh, who was, uh, his name was Dominique, and uh, he owned uh, the, uh, the Palace of Chocolate, Le Palais du Chocolat in uh, DC back then. And um, Dominique was also a silver medal uh, for the best worker of France. And I met with Dominique and he told me, Eric, it seems like no matter which job we can find you, you don't want them. What's going on? I said, well, I'm really dreaming of creating my shop. I said, well, it's okay. Um, but I'm too young. I don't have much money. Oh, don't worry. You know, I studied and I had a job on the side and that's how I made it happen. You know, you have a good head on your shoulder. You should be okay. So Dominique, who became the godfather of my company, uh, really was a very incremental person at the very right time. Like a mentor for you? He became a mentor for sure. Mm -hmm. When I decided to open up the company, I told him, okay, I got a $10,000 loan. Oh, well, I asked for 2,000 more, so I got 12,000. <laughs> and, um, you know, where do I buy this? Where do I buy that? Dominique was really there all step of the way for me. He was a really a remarkable friend. And um, I say he was because sadly he passed away. Uh, but all along he was a, a really, really great mentor. But D Dominique was really the person who ignited it for me to believe, okay, you can start to do this. You're young, but it doesn't matter. You have nothing. It doesn't matter. Let's go for it. That's great. Mm -hmm. And so that first venture, was that a pastry shop bakery or was it commercial production of puff pastries so i chose to do what lecoq cuisine does um, because with basically twelve thousand dollars on an optimal credit card <laughs> <laughs> um, there's not a whole lot you can purchase yeah and uh, since i had no other backing um, the cheapest way to get in business was to stay wholesale the cheapest way to be in business is to try to avoid buying too much equipment. Making cakes will have meant an oven, will have meant everything that mm -hmm. we know we need. So that was the cheapest way. However, I did start with croissant and chocolate candy. So I could have been one of the pioneers of chocolate as well. And I started the company in November uh, 1991. In December, I did $504 of sales at the end of November. Mm -hmm. So December, once I got all set up, I did $504 of sale. And of course, uh, the rest is history. But uh, I sold equally very quickly the same amount of chocolate on croissant. And I had to make a choice. Mm -hmm. I loved both. But there was something about the fermentation of the dough that always appealed to me since I was young. And I, what I mean by young, I was a very fortunate a friend of my dad at the bakery. And I would love hanging around there. So uh, the fermentation was always dear. When I did my formal training, I loved it equally. So I s decided to choose the croissant. And also, deep down, I really wanted to bring uh, the croissant to America. There were some croissants, but they were quite awful. Uh, they were some kind of piece of bread. My goal when I created the company, my vision be became, because it was a wholesale business, I want to be the guy who brings the most quality croissant to this country. Um, and now we're shy of producing a million pieces a day or so, uh, actually more or less, uh, depending on which product, so I guess kind of succeeded that's there. incredible wow. so these are unbaked frozen croissants ready to go oven ready yes uh, the reason i did that um it's well again i had to buy an oven a truck uh, i didn't have the finance so i went in a raw business so i would prepare the product soup to nuts just freeze it and then the people had to bake them 
So the first many years were just frozen croissant. Then after a while, um, I realized my customer were really struggling with properly proofing on mm-hmm. baking it. As you know, it's a beautiful science. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I, on, on again, coming from Le Bernardin on Dalvoyo, I was only a crazy perfectionist, right. let's be honest. So I wanted to make the best product. So how do I make sure my customer have the real result of the fruit of my work so they equally can be pleased? So then that's when uh, Ready to Bake came. So where we proof them, we egg wash them, and therefore almost everybody can start to bake the product from even home now. So completely ready to bake product from freezer to the oven. Absolutely. And you get a flaky, buttery, perfect croissant. Yes. Oh. It makes so much sense. Right? And you really, I mean, at the time, was anybody else doing this in North America with any level of quality? There was a company uh, uh, called Vie de France. Okay. And Vie de France, from what I understood when I met with some of the past owners, was pretty much a little local cuisine that grew on somehow, like many companies can do. They can lose their way um, mm. they did start to lose their way when i started they were decent but then they really lost their way my commitment to quality was the only thing i knew for me coming to work is is passion uh first all my customers all my friends they are the best chef in the country so i can only keep up with myself and with them so it's never about making money or profits. It's about making the best product. When you make the best product, inherently, you always will be successful as long as you can run the company properly. So it was always about making the very, very, very best. On making that switch to ready to bake uh, was an important one because sadly, the know-how or the space in the kitchen shrank on not needing a proof box, not needing the expertise, became very helpful to our customers. And it enabled me to really have a better quality out there. If you do ask me, is a proof on bake better than a ready to bake? Yeah, by a margin. But if you don't proof it well, the ready to bake always takes over. So it's a, it's a really, a uh, beautiful thing to be able to provide to your customers the very best product. And uh, when I started the company, there was also another pivotal moment in the career of Le Coq Cuisine that we met. One day, uh, Greg Kunz, uh, who was at the time the chef at uh, the St. Regis, he called me and said, you know, Eric, your product is great, but we need better. I said, what do you mean, chef? He said, well, I wanted to crumble like a French croissant. And I had this look, I was like, oh. say what? I say, fantastic, I've been waiting for somebody to tell me that. Uh, so at the end, I made a really good croissant, but I knew I couldn't make it perfect to my standard yet because America was not ready for it. So all of a sudden, I have Gray who was asking me to make the most delicious crumbling croissant. Um, yeah, two weeks later he had it. So right. the, wait, the initial recipe was made more for the American palate? Yes or no. Okay. Yes, uh, it was made for the French, for my palate. Mm-hmm. I always, somehow I always chose to do what I thought was best. Sure. But I made sure it was not overly crunchy by the time you baked, you know, on... You can work with the fermentation on the recipe formulation to really achieve what you want. So it wouldn't be overly crunchy. So the taste was there, but not the crunchiness. Yeah. For me, like the crunches. Oh, I love like a croissant that the... shatters and there's yes. crumbs everywhere and it's very, it's, all over it's a it, messy yeah. experience, but it's delicious. That to me is like, is part of the experience of eating a croissant. Well, absolutely. <laughs> no, uh, when I describe what is a perfect croissant. I was about to ask you, mm-hmm. what is the perfect croissant? Well, first you fall in love with the way it looks because it looks beautiful. I'm like, wow, sure. oh, I really want to eat this one. Not this one, but I want the one on the left, right? So it starts with a visual. Uh, then it's a, it's a smell because you, you grab it. Well, no, actually, I take it back. Then you actually touch it. On perfect, uh, a perfect croissant also has a beautiful silky texture. 
So when it's in your hand, it just feels very sensual. It's beautiful. It's not greasy. You should not have any butter smearing your hands. That will be a big mistake. So already you have this beautiful tactile uh, experience. And as you bring the croissant toward you, then you smell it and you have all that beautiful buttery uh, nuttiness that comes out from the fermentation on the butter. And then the next thing is the sound, even before your test buds hit it. So as you, you know, crackle into that croissant, then it gives you all that beautiful sound. And then you finally have the tasteful experience. And, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful experience. I always say that uh, I'm very lucky. One of the, my job is to give many, many people every day the first smile of the day. Did you see how Eric lit up yes. when talking about croissant? And now I want a croissant. You're, I'm, I'm like dying drooling over here. And but... while you're telling the story, I was thinking about, I can actually remember the first croissant I ever had in my life. And I, too, was in an exchange trip in France. Mm -hmm. So I went from suburban Westchester County, New York, for two weeks to stay with a family in France when I was a sophomore in high school. And I remember I got up the first morning I was there. I had jet lag, and they had fresh croissants. And because they were kids, they sliced it in half, which I'd never seen before. And then they said, you can put it in the toaster if you want. This is not traditional but they put it in the toaster and we spread jam on it. And I was like, my goodness, this is so much better than the toast that we have in the U S <laughs> and it's better than a muffin. And it's, it's so good. And that memory still sticks with me to this day. It was strawberry jam and a toasted croissant. And you don't really ever see people slicing it like no. across, but that was my first croissant wow. experience. Yeah. Your face, you looked almost like childlike when you were describing it. And it's probably something that since you were a child, you've been eating them. And Well, I get very childlike probably with everything I touch when I can work out of passion. Yeah. Um, that has always been the goal with the company, with my life. It's just to do everything out of passion, not because of any other reason. Um, I think that's the best way to live your life. I love it. The other thing I remember from that trip was Chausson au Pom. Pom. It was the oh. first time I ever tried that, which is a basically an apple turnover or mm -hmm. croissant with apple stuffing. Were you making other types of pastry besides just the you know, traditional croissant? Yeah. How long did it take you to introduce the rest uh, of the line? You know, it's, it's a funny question. So we started with the croissant, with the chocolate croissant, and then the, what we call in French the pain au raisin, uh -huh. which is the, the raisin croissant with the pastry cream. Uh, for, the, for quite a while, that was it, because you know, I was alone and I had to kind of maximize my time. Like every second was calculated when I started the business. Um, but of course, with the years, the chef has different product. And we introduced one product I absolutely loved, loved and love, is the raspberry Danish. Um, very American or very... Actually, or is it very Eastern I European? I feel like, no, I feel like in France, like... Uh, maybe now, but so the funny thing is, mm -hmm. you know, when you were talking about your f croissant experience, yeah. first, it's phenomenal. How yeah. lucky were you? Um, you reminded me of me when I came here of discovering the Pop-Tart because uh -huh. you were oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe we have to rework on the Pop-Tart. I feel like somebody's <laughs> been doing the Pop-Tart. Yeah. An elegant pop tart. I don't know if it was Christina I've seen Tosi a lot of, uh, or somebody was doing a fancy pop tart. Yeah, maybe we'll have to start to produce some really super duper uh, pop tart. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so the raspberry croissant came upon, and um, that was an, uh, a great product. Have you tried in France what we call, I think it's called Pie d'Or? Uh, it's uh, from Lu, L U, uh -huh. and uh, it's a you know, commercial. Oh, the make. cookie company. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. Okay. So cook on a, it's like a gaufre, uh, like a waffle -y uh -huh. thing with a little layer of raspberry. Ooh. So when I worked my Danish croissant, I decided, okay, how do I make a French twist here? So I worked with multiple kind of raspberry jam to reproduce that flavor. However, it's entrapped into a croissant dough, well, Danish dough, um, which is slightly sweeter and so forth. But uh, so when I test my raspberry uh, Danish, I actually remember the Lue flavor and I 
swear all the French chefs or the foreigners that know uh -huh. of them, they say, oh, it tastes like a lu. I say, yes. That's great. Uh, the other product I did was a cheese danish. Mm -hmm. Okay, how does a Frenchman do a good cheese danish? Well, not very well, let's be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> So uh, I used to sell uh, my Danish dough uh, to the world of Astoria. On one day, the chef, uh, Michael Hu at the time, Michael called me and said, Eric, we would like you to make the cheese Danish for us. I said, oh, sure, I have some. He said, yeah, I know, I tasted it. It's not very good. I said, no problem. Um, I need help. Mm -hmm. Say, well, if you don't mind, you know, we use your dough to make your, our cheese Danish. But we would like you to make our recipe. I said, great. And I tasted it, well, hand down, better. So we made a cheese danish for him. And then I asked him, do you mind if I can actually keep that recipe for all our customers? So the, our cheese danish is the original recipe from the world of Astoria. I love wow. that you are so open-minded. The ego is in check that you are because a lot of people if you said yep you know you're so passionate about what you do you're so good at what you do and then you walk into a gray coons at les Benas and he says you need to make a better croissant or you walk into the waldorf astoria and they said your cheese danish isn't that good and instead of going you know what screw, screw you, you close yeah. the door and leave you're like tell me how to make it better yeah and i think that anybody listening to this is the greatest thing that you're so open-minded and so welcoming to to that aspect. Um, it's actually su very surprising to me. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, to be a great student of life, you need to remain a student. On, therefore, you need to listen. Yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah, always be learning and improving. Yeah. So talk to us about, so today you had humble beginnings, $405 that first month. Now there's a million. 504, John. Oh, sorry, 504. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean to cheap you out of the $99. <laughs> um, That's why I'm here. <laughs> where is Le Coq today? Are there, how many products are there in the lineup? Chef's Warehouse is a great partner mm -hmm. of yours. We love Absolutely. these products. You know, it's interesting today too, things have changed since the days that you were the pastry chef at Le Bernardin. Yes. There are, and maybe it's just me, but I mm -hmm. don't feel that there are as many marquee pastry yeah. chefs that there used to be the, I mean, there's like, more attention to yeah. to value added and having these products that are very laborious to make yeah incredibly tough to make laminated dough is not easy to make that they're these products are ready for a restaurant to put in the oven you know proof put in the oven and go that's been a big change in the industry i would think you change so um in terms of our product lines, we have a great croissant line, a great Danish line. We also have a beautiful savory line. We were one of the pioneers to actually make savory croissant. Didn't work really well at the beginning, but at the end of mind, I knew people would come to it. And now people are all over it. It's all over New I York. I love them, yeah, personally. It's great. Ooh. What are some of the flavors? Uh, we have a ham and cheese. We have a spinach ricotta. We have a bacon and egg. Somehow we were able to create a frozen, ready-to-bake bacon and egg. And that was really complicated because you don't want your eggs to be like a piece of rubber mm -hmm. right? from being overbaked from the croissant timing. So making that work was really a labor of love, which we succeeded. Uh, and we have new products coming up as well. And we also make brioche. And... One of my joy and pride, as you were mentioning before, the apple turnover. Uh, we make puff pastry and apple turnovers on other declination. Uh, we also do what you call the elephant ears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so uh, the puff pastry is another amazing product, which is sold to a lot of chefs throughout the nation. Um, whether, and of course, I can't really say names because, but the chef are okay with uh you know accepting that some of the product they do buy but uh, when you're in a restaurant or a small kitchen you don't always have a laminoir dosh either so you will buy the puff pastry so even le bernardin back then 
used to buy my puff pastry when they needed some or Daniel as well. And of course, when he has his commissary in New York, he doesn't need my help anymore, but he does some other part of the country, whether mm -hmm. it's Florida or Las Vegas. So it's a beautiful relationship to still be able to be close with all those amazing chefs because they will keep you in check. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time uh, meeting uh, Mr. Alain Ducasse, who was tasting my puff pastry on, he gave me- uh, Were you nervous? No. Okay. No, it's funny. I was not. Uh, I was uh, definitely. Like confident? No, I, I, no, I was not that either. I was very uh, impressed by who he is because I was very young at the time. Uh, but I was not nervous. I knew what I could do. You know, technically, I could have worked in any of his restaurants back then. Sure. So, uh, but no, I, I was just very respectful. Um, he's a remarkable man, of course, as we know. Did he like your puff pastry? He did. Okay. There, okay. <laughs> I was getting nervous. I thought yeah. he was going to tell I'm you like, you needed to change something. He spit too. it out. <laughs> no, he did. On uh, yeah, I, I had also Michel Richard when he sure. came mm -hmm. back to New York. Yeah. I met Michel, on he, so he needed croissant for the hotel and puff pastry. And I remember I brought the pro I baked everything uh, again. It was a while ago, so I, but I wanted to meet with him because he was a legend. Sure, um, he is a legend. So I wanted to meet with him. So I baked myself the product and I sat with him. And Michel tasted my puff pastry on him, and he went, "Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> that's great!" Yeah. So I think that chefs. Who we, we talked about it. It's it's really to make these products. It takes a lot of equipment. It takes a lot of time. So now, and I feel like especially since COVID, are you? Did you see like a huge spike? Yes, and um, there's something very interesting that is happening yeah. in our world lately. Um, the spike of not being able to make it mm -hmm. is there, but the desire to make premium product has absolutely skyrocketed, but they still don't necessarily have the equipment. So one of the things that we have seen literally explode is the sale of the laminated dough. So the chef can buy our perfect croissant dough, Danish dough, puff pastry, and even brioche. And then it's either in bulk or in sheets. And the sales of sheets have just, because like this, they don't need a laminoir, mm -hmm. a dough sheeter. So the, the sales of sheet has, I couldn't even, it's, it's multiplied by 100 wow. in the past three years. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Now we literally just dedicated the line to keep up with that because there's so much demand. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. The demand has skyrocketed on people by our dough and then they can make their own creation, their own look. Mm -hmm. They can do those things without the equipment. Yep. That's for the one who have the, the desire. And of course, in the hotel industry, well, that has already been established, ready to bake, end mm -hmm. of the story. Uh, so much so that, again, out of passion, we went from the good local croissant to what is the ultimate croissant. And uh, this one, uh, we call the line the artisanal line. And we made a croissant that looks just like if it was made in the best little corner pastry shop somewhere in Paris or in the south of France. And the matching chocolate croissant, a beautiful apple turnover, mm -hmm. which I decided to make rectangular. Nice. Because I want an equal proportion mm -hmm. of bite. So you don't have the half moon one and you have a lot of dough and then you have too much compote. So, and we put pieces of apple, but uh, yeah, so we now offer the amazing line of those, but also the ultimate line, the artisanal line, which what you'll guys carry. It, what makes it, uh, what are the ingredients like a higher fat butter or what, are, you know, what makes it the next level? Yes, uh, really good question. So the communion of butter on dough on, uh, within the dough is very, very important. Too much is actually not good. I was, I was mentioning if you touch it and you have greasy finger, not good. If you eat a croissant and you're like, oh, oh uh, not good either. When my goal is when you finish a Le Coq croissant, 
is you actually kind of want to have another one, but no, you shouldn't. <laughs> and you may actually decide to treat yourself. Then I succeeded. I love that. I'm not asking you to have three, otherwise you're in big trouble. <laughs> but yeah, I really want to leave you with that intense desire to have another one. So how do we achieve that better, uh, that ultimate artisanal croissant? That really was born from kind of a frustration of n knowing that I could do better, but the industry was not necessarily ready for me. So at some point I say, well, heck with it. I'm just going to do the very, very best I can do. I'll not worry about cost and the customers will come. And that's again what happened. A little bit uh, different fermentation, uh, different amount of butter, slightly more, but not so much. On definitely a beautiful, sexy look, so it's very handmade. I'm, I, even so, they are not handmade completely, but we want to make sure the product looks different. Each one is slightly different. They want, I want you to experience the small bakery in the, your everyday life, whoever is the customer. I love it. I love listening to talk. I know. Right? This has been such a wonderful conversation. Should we go eat a croissant? I want to go eat a croissant right now. <laughs> or two, apparently. I bet Andrea is going to want to add. This has been a great conversation. We yes, can talk I do for have hours a, I do have one question for you. Do you cook at home? Always. Still Always. cook. Still love I love it. that. I'm not surprised okay. by that answer at all. What are the five ingredients that you have to have in your kitchen at all times? In the pantry. In the pantry or the fridge. Uh, hmm. Okay, so I will say, well, it starts with really, really fresh. So that, I can't really answer that, but maybe I will. So for me, when I... You can't leave until you yeah, do. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Julian, okay. will you lock that door, locked. please? Okay, well, all right. So <laughs> number <Okay>. one is... <laughs> number one is, you know, whenever I, I decide to go to the market, I don't go on like, okay, I'm going to make this dish, just like every other chef. The ingredients are calling me and say, okay, sure. you know, this looks great and this looks mm -hmm. great and the moment comes. So, but very, very fresh, beautiful vegetables. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love focusing on a clean eating. Um, and then one spice I do love, uh, cardamom. Um, and it can be done savory or sweet. Yeah. And of course, you don't want to abuse it. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, an amazing olive oil is very important. Yeah. Somehow, uh, I love cooking with Hawaiian salt. Hawaiian salt, okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. Like the black salt? No, not the black one. Okay. The sea, just the, just not white sea, Hawaiian not salt. Not black, not pink, yeah. just the just white. white. The but Hawaiian I love the salt. crystal uh, uh -huh. Hawaiian salt. It just has a, a really beautiful flavor profile. I love the crunchiness mm -hmm. it can bring. Uh, and of course, you know, I'm French and we have the sea salt, so I should probably prefer the French salt and I do love it too. And I will use it as well, but I do love, uh, uh, the Hawaiian, uh, sea salt. And, uh, one more, one more, one more. One you more. can do it. I can't believe he didn't say butter. Butter. I mean, I'm waiting for you to say butter. butter. But that's okay. Me too. It's all right. I well, read her mind. I, I knew you guys were going to go there, but I actually, actually, I don't. No? Uh, no, only okay. for pastries. I, right. I need to pace myself. So know? more olive oil for savory than butter. Uh, more olive okay. oil for savory, for sure. Uh, hmm. Well, yeah, the Pop other tarts? ones. I'm sorry? Pop-tarts? Is that an Pop ingredient? Tarts? Is that an ingredient? No, okay. it no. won't count. It is in my house. I, I would mean, say, you know, I'll just pick all the most beautiful herbs in my vegetable garden. I love, this is a, those were great really answers. Yeah. And the one thing I want to jump back to is cardamom. Because I feel like cardamom came to me late in life. Yeah, same. And more, again, an experience and something that sticks out in my mind is the first time I went to Sweden and Scandinavia mm -hmm. and had a cardamom bun. Mm -hmm. Because I had Swedish friends mm -hmm. that would always talk about cardamom buns, cardamom buns. And I'm like, what is this cardamom bun that they speak of? And my mind doesn't even go to Sweden when you say cardamom. What is it? Where does it go for you? Like more India? India. Yeah. Yeah, and like chai and... Kind of those spices. Is cardamom but. something that a French chef in the 80s or 90s was cooking with? 
Absolutely not that I know of. Yeah. I discovered so many amazing ingredients in this country. Yeah. And I didn't discover them because they're American. It's because all of the best chefs mm. from the world come to New York and come mm -hmm. to America. So I discovered uh, the pleasure of all those great spices in America and, uh, you know, even cloves. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and of course, well, that we used back home, but vanilla, you know, scallops and vanilla, it's an amazing combination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Well, this thank is, you so much. Yeah, thank you. This has been really awesome. We literally could talk for two hours or more. I yeah. want to go eat some. Let's go eat some croissants. Right yeah. Now. Yeah, I think we need to do that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining thank us. Thank you as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of Ingredient Insiders. Follow us on Instagram at Ingredient Insiders. You can find the products we discussed on today's episode at chefswarehouse.com or at your favorite specialty retailer. 